Right, so, hey everybody, um, yeah, we are Christina Grisot and Michael Kurzmeier, and we're here to talk about the SSH Open Marketplace and Clarion. So I'm going to start by giving you a quick overview of what I want to talk about, which is introducing the marketplace, giving you a brief overview of how it works, walking you through our data curation process, and then obviously linking back to how the marketplace fits into Clarion, and at the same time, obviously, promoting this platform. So what is the marketplace in a nutshell? It's a discovery platform. It's a curated catalog of tools and thing, other things than tools. We'll come to that. And I think this is very interesting. So last year, for example, we had a workshop with PhD students, and we asked them, what tools would you like to see, and what tools do you know of? And consistently, people said they would like to see a curated catalog of tools relevant to what they do. But at the same time, the, hardly anyone knew about the SSH marketplace. Um, so I think it's great that we're here. And that's why I also want to promote that a little bit. We'll go into details about what that is. That's the landing page. And that's our URL, marketplace.sshopencloud.eu. And you can go in there and you can search for tools. Um, you see there on the top, we have tools and services, we have training materials, we have publications, data sets, and workflows. And we'll talk through them in a little bit more detail now. So generally, how does the marketplace fit into the European Open Science Cloud? So we are part of the European Open Science Cloud marketplace. We're integrated with other core services. Most important for users is probably identity management. So if you have a diary ID, if you have any ID that federates, you can also log into the marketplace there. But you don't need to log in at all to just use it and search for tools. That is all good. But if you want to submit a tool or workflow yourself, or if you want to review, then obviously that's where you need to log in. And we started out by taking data from the European Open Science Cloud Marketplace and linking it back to ours, and we're in the process of setting up this bi-directional flow of information, whereas entries that we have now curated in the marketplace, we can feed them back into the Open Science Cloud catalog. What we really want to do is increase findability for SSH resources in general, and also provide a resource that is, I think, always think this is a good resource, to point students towards when they ask, how, where can I find material? And this is a good place for them to get started. And then I talk about how the marketplace works. So three pillars really that's in there. So we have contextualization, which is we have those resources, but we don't just list them, we contextualize them. I'll talk a little bit more about the different types, but just for example, we would have workflows, and a workflow would show how different tools could be used in research um, on a given data set to produce outputs, which is something that links those entries together. And we also have publications where that's relevant. We have a curation. I think that's that's really a good part. We have the curation that, that is done by the editorial board. And so I've joined the editorial board about a year ago and I think it's great to have this diversity of research in the board and to have actual researchers on this board to make sure that all the tools are in there are actually relevant for the research that people do. Um, and then we have a community, which is, you know, you can submit new tools and it's going to be reviewed by the editorial board. And we are also going to have people that submit material in general, and then we can follow on the actual research practices. Um, briefly talking about the inclusion criteria, and um, also I think this is what sets the marketplace apart from other similar catalogs. So, and we just, is that relevant to the community? Is that a tool that is actually used in everyday research? Um, is it technically available? So is it maintained or sustainable? Um, it could be a script, it could be a full-on program that people submit. We do, um, that's up to them, but obviously we want it to be maintained and we want it to be sustainable so people can reproduce it, specifically in the context of open science. So all those tools that we put in there, they should all be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, obviously, and they should just be tools that you know, contribute to open science. And then we don't want duplicate entries. Obviously, that's where the editorial board comes in, and especially when you take, when you mass ingest data from other sources, you have to make sure that you don't end up with duplicate entries. And that brings us to the next one. So over the years, as I said, I joined a year ago, so I can't speak too much to this. 
but um, 15 sources have been ingested for a total of over 5,000 individual items. And I'm sure you can all imagine that if you work with 15 different sources, that brings a unique set of challenges that you have to negotiate. Just to mention one or two, uh, it's just different metadata standards for programs that come into different folk that collections would have and different level of detail in general, because we want to have as much data on those tools as possible. And yes, yeah, so that's what we're dealing with in the mass ingestion. But we can also have the manual process, whereas people add content. And as I said, you can log in, um, reflect on the inclusion criteria, choose an item type, you know, tool, training material, publication, data set, fill in the form, and it's going to come to the editorial board and they'll review it and they'll approve it. So that is also, you know, while I'm here, I can say this is also a great place for people to promote tools that they have maybe created. Also, same goes for workflows. We have training materials. So it's both a good source to find training materials, but also if you have developed something, maybe for a workshop, and you would like to deposit it somewhere so you could reuse it or other people could reuse it, the SSH Open Marketplace would also great, be a great place for that. So then obviously I've mentioned a little bit there, uh, why do this at all? You know, you can um, gain access to useful and well curated resources and they're all going to be in the spirit of fair and open data. And you can, as I said, also, if you're dealing with students, point them towards this as a very good source. I said, a lot of students would not be aware the source exists, but at the same time, they express that they would find a source like this very useful. So I think this is a good place, good thing to tell your students about um, you can promote your own work, tools, workflows, and so on. And if you're interested, you can also become actively involved. You can be a basic contributor or you can join the editorial board and be an advanced curator. Then very quickly, I mentioned tools and services or the content types. So we have tools and services, uh, we have training materials, we have publications, publications as long as they relate to tools and services. So it's not primarily a platform to put publications on, such as the Nodo, for example. Um, the publications are relevant when they, they show what has been produced using tools and services. Um, then data sets and workflows. Workflows is what we want to focus on a little bit because they contextualize the material. And that just as an example here, that's a page for a tool. You know, it has a title, it has a description as a status and it has a link to the tool. And we have the same here. That's a, a workflow, for example. And, oh, that's the training material. I'm sorry, that's the, tra that's the training material. You're absolutely right. <laughs> and um, yeah, as I said, that is also a great place to do. If you have developed training materials or if you're looking for training materials, that is also a very good place to deposit them. And finally, this is the workflow. Um, the workflow, you know, has different steps and shows what can be done with tools and training material uh, and data sets. And what the workflows do, I think they really contextualize and give a good use case. Again, if you pointed the student towards them, they would not only learn about an isolated selection of tools, but they would also learn how to actually employ these tools in research. And that's a example of uh, a data set. And Right, let me just go through the workflows, for example, as I said, yeah, workflows are research scenarios and show what can be achieved using tools. And they tie everything together in the sense of, you know, they show what is doable uh, using these tools. And that's the end of my section. And I have to end it on a sad note. We had to cancel the workshop that was supposed to happen tomorrow afternoon, but we're still around if you have any questions or if you'd like to learn more about the marketplace in general. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, so I will wrap up this, question, this presentation. So I think it's going to be much shorter than what we imagined. But we wanted to uh, say a few words about the data curation uh, process because this is one of the uh, three pillars of the marketplace. So curation of the data and metadata. Um, so roughly curation starts with the mass ingestion of sources, so the identification of relevant sources, their harvesting and ingestion into the marketplace. Um, this is uh, in parallel, uh, well, complemented in parallel with the create, manual creation of uh, uh, items, so contributions, contributors have to add 
individual items um, and uh, as we said before um, uh, the, the procedure to how to add is well described and also uh, they are encouraged to fill as many metadata fields as possible. Um, then the third uh, uh, piece of the puzzle is the curation uh, prioritization. So the moderators, so the members of the uh, editorial board uh, set up curation priorities and also they pilot curation campaigns to improve metadata quality. Um, for example, last week there was a week for um, uh, curation of DARIA um, uh, resources um, uh, run by two members of the editorial board um, uh, and um, people from each DARIA country were, uh, there, there was a possibility to, um, to join this uh, campaign to work on curating their national resources and the members of the editorial board were present to support them during the process um, <clears throat> um, uh, offline and online. Um, then the fourth piece is the enrichment um, of the um, metadata fields. So contributors are encouraged to enrich, uh, enrich existing items. Um, and finally, uh, this gets us to the collective uh, curation. Uh, so both contributors and moderators working towards metadata quality um, improvement. Um, <clears throat> so metadata, as we said, it's, also, it's manual, but it's also uh, automatic. And this is uh, an example of curation uh, notebooks and curation flags. Um, so this, there is a, um, a, um, a, a data library that was created to um, a Python library that was created to access the marketplace da uh, data, uh, which is used uh, for digital curation via the um, API that gives access to the data set. And uh, we are also here to speak about the marketplace and Clarin, as you have seen uh, from the beginning, uh, Clarin is one of the um, uh, three uh, infrastructures that have created and maintained the marketplace on a regular basis. Um, Roughly uh, until now, uh, uh, we, some of the Clarion resources are already in the marketplace, uh, namely the tools from the switchboard, uh, but also tools, corpora and lexical resources from the Clarion resource families. And with respect to this, there is a continuous ingestion uh, to be sure that um, the marketplace remains up to date because as you, uh, of course, know, uh, um, the resource families and the switchboard are continuously um, um, modified. So as new resources are added, um, there was a very recent up to, uh, uh, update about uh, for the, these two um, uh, tools on uh, resource um, uh, says on behalf of Clarin and their uh, ingestion into the marketplace, uh, something like last week. And also we have um, uh, added the, so the upskills outcomes are also added in the marketplace now as training materials. Um, they, it's possible to ma manually add them, but also uh, harvested by the, um, via the SSH training discovery uh, toolkit. We also have some future plans uh, and we hope that discussions will go well with the Clarin uh, community and BOD. So roughly the idea is to see how the, we can improve the connection of the marketplace and uh, VLO. And this could be uh, roughly this means to investigate in what, in what way the marketplace can complement the Clarin infrastructure with the different uh, parts of the Clarin infrastructure, both from a technical point Point of view, uh, like for example, mutual harvesting, uh, but also from the point of view of increasing the findability and accessibility of language data. And then um, there is another uh, plan which was uh, suggested uh, or pointed out by one of the reviewers. So we also want to thank you, that person, for the suggestion. It's an important point indeed that there are. Um, more and more discovery pl platforms that exist. Uh, of course, the Clarion discovery platform itself, um, uh, um, uh, platforms, uh, the marketplace, the US marketplace, and the, the idea would be actually to make sure that we understand what are the similarities and complementarities between the, these different uh, discovery platforms and um, 
uh, resources so that we can better inform uh, and guide users. So when I mean users, both users who deposit resources and users who uh, use the mm, platform to find resources. And um, uh, with respect to the marketplace itself, there are at least two uh, uh, distinguishing points with respect to the other platforms. So the first, the first one is that it shows, showcases resources in a contextualized, uh, contextualized manner. So linked with the, uh, there are links with the other resources, and uh, also it proposes a unique type of resource, which is that of workflows. And as we said, we wanted to organize this uh, uh, workshop on creating workflows using uh, Clarin resources that are uh, on the marketplace, but this will be, uh, hopefully, <laughs> will take place with a different occasion in the future. Um, thank you for your attention. Thanks. Uh, I would like to ask uh, about your metadata inclusion policy, if I understood correctly. There could be people um, adding metadata that are not necessarily authors of resources or tools. Uh, do you then have some, uh, some procedure in place that you inform the original author that this uh, entry has been added so that they have a chance to check the metadata in the description? Because sometimes some other user could misunderstand or misinterpret things and do a disservice to the original author. And if they do not know that this is happening, they cannot pay attention to it, check it and correct it. Um, I, I don't think we already have like um, a procedure um, that we should consider um, um, discussing this in the editorial board. I can only say by, by experience for the Swiss uh, resources that we have added on the marketplace, before I added uh, e any of the resources, I first got in touch with the authors to say, hey, we can, we can do this and this and this to increase the fairness of your data. Do you agree? Um, they have all agreed. So then I added the resources on the marketplace. Um, only one person said, I would like to see, to check with you how you filled in the different metadata fields, just to be sure that you have correctly understood my resource. Uh, so I did this with her. Um, um, and then, of course, uh, as everyone has access to, uh, can connect to the, to the platform using their YOSC uh, um, um, login, anyone can actually, even the authors themselves, uh, get there and, um, and uh, modify if possible. But that, that's a point we can add in terms of documentation and um, like formal uh, requirements or something like this that we can discuss. Thank you for the question. Um, it is, uh, in general, uh, very difficult to find what you need if you don't know the exact name of the tool that you're looking for. So the question is, how do you make it uh, possible for people to find what they need? I see that you use a kind of Tadira uh, tags, but I think these are too broad to get to a, let's say, fast to you, to the things that you want. If you want to do something very specific, you need, I think, more specific uh, terminology and tags added to the tools and resources that you have. So you can uh, filter by keywords. Uh, you can filter, of course, by types of activities. You can filter using the Tadira uh, classification. You can filter by um, um, by uh, uh, country who, uh, from where the, the um, resource comes from. And you can, of course, search in the search bar with uh, the, the words that, like keywords that you are interested in and just uh, find the, re then check the results of the search. So all this is possible, yes. We, we didn't uh, plan for a, um, a demo because of the time and also because we thought we would have the workshops. <laughs> So maybe, maybe the, the workflows would also be a good place to start for someone who doesn't quite know what they're looking to do yet because the workflows could give you an example of how those tools could be used and if that would potentially something that the person would want to look into. So I think the workflow contextualizes what the, the use of the tool could potentially be beyond what a search even by tags and activities might reveal. Yes, and I see one more question and that will be the last question, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you possibly um, explain a bit 
how much time it takes for you to create uh, the individual services. I mean, just as Jan said, if you add a lot of additional um, tags or categories, it will definitely need more time. And uh, especially if you have something like uh, start here, if you do not know what you're searching for, for something like, uh, uh, like, a, a, like a process, uh, that wouldn't actually take a lot of time to do that. And um, so an editorial team for an indefinite number of possibly possible tools uh, would probably be very challenging. So um, the editorial board is uh, composed of um, uh, seven or eight people who uh, are work for the editorial board. They come from um, the three infrastructures, so Clarin, Sesta and Daria. So they spend quite a lot of time. Uh, then they have complemented this with uh, nine um, uh, volunteers like me and Michael. Uh, we spend a bit of time, uh, depends on really on our uh, time availabilities. Um, and also we all, um, there are these automatic uh, flags and priorities and each of us has a, well, a moderating board and we see there on the board uh, what uh, on what we are called or invited to to curate so roughly this is on the side of the editorial board so there there is some time investment and of course we also count on um uh especially with the manual adding resources um on the contributors themselves to from the beginning actually to uh, to uh, add resources which are well documented and also the marketplace is very young so it's only uh, been what one years and one year and a few months that it started so um, we still have resources to curate this and we'll have to think in the future how this will um, continue